wanted to start off. A couple things I wanted to start off with. First, pretty much right as class ended last week, I was reading the news online and there was a uh, story which actually exactly fits one of the things we talked about last week. And the story, uh, I bet some of you saw it, was about a, an environmental organization called Sunrise. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sunrise is this very large uh, uh, environmental group that was doing a major march in Washington, DC. And they uh, decided that they would rather not march than partner with the Jewish organizations who had signed on to their, the, the, the Jewish organizations had already signed on as co-sponsors. Um, uh, but they decided that the, the, um, uh, the, the Sunrise said, we would rather call off the march um, uh, than, than uh, participate with Jewish groups. I'm gonna, I'm gonna find the exact statement here. Um, uh, uh, to read. I read that. I read that also, Rabbi. Yes, the same story. Yeah, um, very, very. Uh, here, here's the here's here's the the story as it originally appeared. Oh, let me find out here. Oh, wait a minute. Disappeared. Okay. Um. Oh, it's interesting. Um. The, it was the, the DC group um, that did it and the national group uh, uh, condemned the DC group. This is, okay, so here we go, here we go, okay. Um, okay, uh, Sunrise took aim at three Jewish American groups in its statement. The Jewish Council on Public Affairs, the National Council of Jewish Women and the Religious Action Center uh, of Reform Judaism. Uh, another group, Jewish group participating in the rally, Ben the Ark, was not included in a statement. That's interesting. Given our commitment to racial justice, self-governance, and indigenous sovereignty, we oppose Zionism and any state that enforces its ideology, uh, Sunrise wrote in a statement posted to Twitter. I'm pulling up that statement right now. Um, see exactly what it, what the rest of the statement said. Um, uh, Israel, uh, in its occupation of the land of Palestine, its people has and continues to engage in violent, oppressive tactics that go against the values we advocate for as a hub. As a colonial project, Israel routinely displaces Palestinians through the construction of settlements and the wholesale theft uh, of homes and land. It also treats all Palestinians as well and as black and brown Jewish Israelis as second class citizens who have virtually no responsive representation in government often subjecting them to extreme policing and brutality. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, we also believe that the fight for statehood and sovereignty are incompatible with Zionism and the political ratio of Palestinians the ideology calls for. We will continue to fight for statehood for DC and the United States and for the liberation of Palestine and ask that coalitions inviting us in the future keep this in mind. We encourage coalitions to vet organizations to ensure that potential members work aligns with the mission of the coalition as a whole. Um, we also ask that the Declaration for American Democracy consider removing JCPA, Jewish Council on Public Affairs, the National Council of Jewish Women, and the Religious Action Center for Reform Judaism from their member from their members list, as Zionism is incompatible with statehood and political sovereignty. <laughs> just think about the irony of that statement. Just on its surface, uh, Zionism is not compatible with statehood and political sovereignty. That's the whole purpose of Zionism: is political sovereignty. It's like saying. Water is not compatible with H2O. I mean, <laughs> they're the same thing. <laughs> um, uh, so anyways, but what's so interesting about this statement is that it exactly embodies what we talked about last week, is that this extreme uh, views on the left that, well, actually, let's step back. Let's, 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 I don't, I don't want to tell all the answers here or give, give my own opinion before I hear from everyone else. What is wrong with this statement? Let's, let's just start there. What's wrong with this? What do you see as the problems of this statement from Sunrise? You know, saying we cannot, that Zionism is inconsistent with our mission as an organization dedicated to voting rights 
and DC statehood, and that we cannot be in coalition with any organization that that is Zionist. So what is wrong with that? Why is that anti-Semitism? Is it anti-Semitism? I was actually unimpressed with the reform movement's response. They, it was weak. It didn't say this is blatant anti-Semitism. It said this is wrong, but didn't say it's blatant anti-Semitism. Maybe they're right. I Maybe my, my views are too, uh, are, are not exact, but what is wrong with this statement? Who wants to chime in? What's wrong with it? Why, why, why is it a big deal? Anybody? Yeah, Neil, go ahead. Well, at the very least, it holds uh, Israel up to standards that uh, the rest of the world is not held up to. And that's just the beginning. Okay, so that's great. So it, it does, it, it, it um, brings up this issue of double standards. Now, remember, at the end of last week, I talked about the difference between legitimate criticism of Israel Israel's not a perfect state by any means. So what is appropriate, legitimate criticism and anti-Semitism? What's the difference? Now, it's not, it's not always black and white, but there are three primary, there's three primary things that cross the line from criticism to anti-Semitism. One is delegitimization. When you say Israel has no right to exist as a country. Now, this statement actually does delegitimize. It says... You know, it essentially says that Zionism, which is the movement for a Jewish state, uh, is is opposed to human rights and so forth. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't say that so blatantly, but that's part of the implication, I would argue. So, so delegitimization, saying Israel has no right to exist, then demonization. That's saying, you know, that's you know the modern equivalent. You know, in the Middle Ages, anti Semites used to say Jews poison wells to kill Christians or Jews use the blood of Christian children to make matzah. You know, these crazy, outrageous arguments. This statement doesn't really do that. There's nothing, it doesn't demonize, it doesn't say anything that, you know, unusual, but double standards, right? So it, you, you don't see it calling out any other, if there was a Muslim group participating, which I'm sure there were, it doesn't say, hey, the participation of a Muslim group is incompatible with the behavior of Saudi Arabia towards its female citizens. You don't see that. So it, it holds Israel to a, a, a standard that it does not apply to anyone else. Uh, and that crosses the line into anti-Semitism because it is uniquely focusing on, is uniquely focusing hostility towards the Jewish state. Okay, good. What else is wrong with this statement? What other, what, 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 what makes this statement, aside from double standards, how does this go from criticism of Israel to anti-Semitism? Yeah, Susan? Well, first of all, it's only taking, a, it's obviously a, a position that is extremely sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. Sure. And many of us are sympathetic to, to and and feel, but they they aren't looking at the history. It's a very one-sided opinion, and they aren't looking at why Palestinians are being discriminated against in in some areas. I mean, they're looking probably at the settlements and at, at certain things that some of us are against anyway. Right. But that's just criticism of the government of Israel right. in certain areas. But it's not, but they're, they're so one-sided and not looking at, and the fact that Zionism, Israel is not an apartheid state. As much as people try to say it is, right. it isn't. Uh, right. There are Arabs in the government. Uh, the Arab citizens of Israel have the right to vote. There are all, I mean, and the only reason there's so many stringent rules about the Palestinians entering proper Israel and all the checkpoints and all this thing is because of the terrorism. And this statement isn't looking at any of that. 
right. Okay. So what you pointed out is it it, it lacks any context. This exactly. statement lacks any context. I would also argue something even deeper. And that is, and this is where this is where I actually think the greatest danger lies. So, and we have to step back and 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 actually, this is actually a really interesting historical issue. The this statement, the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, the National Council of Jewish Women, and the Jewish Council on Public Affairs, these are big Jewish organizations that have a lot of different views. They're, they're involved in a lot of different issues. They have certain groups that are involved with Zionism, Israel, certain groups that are involved with separation of church and state, with immigration. The, the Religious Action Center was participating in this rally for voting rights. It had nothing, the rally, had nothing to do with Israel, had nothing to do with Israel. Yet, because, and be, because the Religious Action Center is, has people in its leadership and takes a view supportive of Israel, automatically any of its activities are suspect and the, 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 the motives and the values of the people who participate in those activities are suspect, uh, and and that is that's anti-Semitism. I mean, that is that is the that is saying that it's almost like saying, um, you know, you remember in the the election with with Jeremiah Wright, everyone was saying, oh, because uh, uh, President Obama was a member of that church, he must hold all those views uh, of the church. Well, most people saw that's just political, you know, people join a church for very different reasons and so forth. Um, uh, people, those who are part of the Religious Action Center, many of them have different motives. They don't all agree on the same thing. So to tar the fact that that one person who's involved with the Religious Action Center may believe very strongly, let's say, in settlements, even though probably most of them don't, to say then that everybody, therefore, is guilty of genocide. If you think the settlements are genocide, therefore everybody who has any connection to the Religious Action Center is guilty of genocide. That is, that's, that's, uh, that's an invalid leap in logic. And so that's what's going on here. Everybody is tarred with the same feather. There's no nuance. And this is extremely dangerous, um, extremely dangerous. I mean, uh, if, 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 um, Every single, I mean, we all do this in human nature. We all do this. You know, there are people today, let's say, for example, people today who will not buy a Ford car or a Mercedes, uh, which I get it, but it's totally illogical. I mean, Ford now is a publicly traded company that's owned by, mostly by pension funds and stockholders. It has nothing to do with Henry Ford, the original, just has the name. It, we're, we're, it, it is a different entity, but because it's called Ford, same with Mercedes, you know, I think Mercedes is owned by Chrysler, right? Dame, I mean, so, you know, essentially the, 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 the companies have a history, but the people doing it now are, are very different than the Nazis. So, but we essentially, through our behavior, I mean, it's, that's not as bad as this is. This is much worse than that, but it springs from the same logic that we are holding one group of people responsible for people they are linked to, but who they are not. And so uh, this actually was a part of the early Reformed Jews opposition to Zionism. Early Reformed Jews, including the founders of Lakeside, right? This is Lakeside, the Society for Classical Reform Judaism, believed that um, American Jews would be accused of dual loyalties if there was a Jewish state in Israel. Now, of course, that view faded away. But the idea is that American Jews are held responsible for what Israel does. And in some ways, that's what's happening here, but even in a, in a, in a perverted sense. So, okay, I kind of went all over the place here, but the idea is that just because certain organizations take a view, therefore all of its members are guilty of the worst possible interpretation of those people's views is anti-Semitism. Yeah. Helen, culture. Go ahead. Well, I, I was about to say something I think that you just touched on, which I think 
in anti-Semitism in America today, particularly from the left, because of our faith, if you are a Jew, you are discriminated against or thought to be less American than because of actions that another nation, the state of Israel takes. If people disagree with political actions taken by Israel, you may see things on a college campus directed against Jewish students, not because they're Israeli, not because they've ever visited Israel, not because they've ever supported Israel, but because they are of the Jewish faith. And that is pure anti-Semitism of the highest order. Exactly, exactly. You know, um, we don't persecute Italian Americans if Italy does something terrible. I mean, people, people, that has happened in American history. I mean, remember, you know, think about Japanese Americans in prison because, which, you know, most people would say was a terrible historical mistake. Uh, um, but, but that is happening to Jewish students. You're absolutely right. That's another news story I read this week. Um, it was on JTA that one third of Jewish college students have directly experienced anti-Semitism. That's a lot. That's, you know, we may think, we may think, oh, it's just a third. The, that's that's a tremendous number. I mean, for most until maybe 10 years ago, it was virtually none. You know, now it's one third of college students. And remember, colleges are overwhelmingly liberal, progressive environments. So this is generally anti-Semitism from the left. This is not this is not, uh, you know, anti-Semitism in you know Louisiana with David Duke. This is a different kind of anti-Semitism. Yeah. Well, I know my son, Jay, did Jay contact you about what happened at, at his medical school? Yes, he sure did. Uh, the fact, Muslim Student Association issued a, a paper blasting Israel, calling, you know, the Israeli government's um, actions genocide and got the university, the medical school somehow distributed to distribute it to every single member of the student body um, as if it was something official. There was quite a brouhaha, there was an apology issued. Um, and it, as it happens, there are a very small number of Jewish students at the medical school. It's not what you or I or the next generation would think of a, you know, medical schools being typically, the Jewish students group is, you know, a dozen people. Um, but it, it was just painting because of, you're, you know, because of your faith, somehow you are less so, right. less American, less worthy. That doesn't generally happen to other groups in America anymore. You don't see Italians or, or if someone is Catholic, you don't see discrimination against them because something the Pope said, right. but you see it because of something people don't like about what the Israeli government does. Then if you're of the Jewish faith, somehow your actions, your mere existence in the school is tainted. Right. Yeah, that's great. You know, my what, dad who's what on- What medical school was it? This is the, the Medical, medical College, College of Wisconsin. Wisconsin. In fact, my dad who was on this call, uh, it was a professor there, it's retired, but, um, uh, and I, I forwarded him with, with Jay's permission, I forwarded him the note and we talked about it. And uh, yeah, it was a, uh, 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 it, it, somehow the, the, the leadership of the school got behind this and then apologized, uh, and, and it was awful. Um, uh, now, uh, let's hear from Marilyn. Then I kind of want to go into explaining why this is the case. Marilyn? Well, um, my bravo to you, and I think that all other religious leaders, regardless of their faiths, yeah. Neat. Your book, I, I received and I'm reading it and I'm really so glad that you're out there because I love when you said in the book that if the world isn't safe for Jews, it's not safe for anybody. And so your message is so important. And when things like this happen, we need to rebuff. We need to do something about it. What was done in this situation? How did Jewish organizations and what was done to respond to this idiotic, ridiculous way of dealing with a cause for environmental, what you said it was an environmental march? Yeah, well, the, it's an environmental organization that was marching for voting rights. Oh. Um, 
Okay, but what was done? I'll when tell you Jews, what was done. What it was, was actually done when Jews were accused of being anti, you know, being Zionist, being anti-Semitic. And also, Rabbi, is that something more prevalent in today's world than it was um, many years ago? I know we've always been scapegoats, but the connection of anti um, being Zionists and being anti-Semitic. What's the connection there that it's so prevalent at this time? Well, that's 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 a it's a great question, um, and I'll go into that. Um, but actually, the the response was fairly positive. So the so this was the local DC chapter, the local DC organization of this group Sunrise that made this statement. The National Sunrise Group condemned the DC group and said, that's not who we are as, as, as an organization. So they said, the DC group did not speak for our national group and we do not hold those views of the Religious Action Center and Jewish National Council of Jewish Women. So that was a good step. Now, interestingly, part of the reason these, these issues are so difficult coming from the progress, like, the reason why, one of the reasons why left-wing anti-Semitism is so difficult is that so many Jews are, are involved in supportive of organizations. So I can almost guarantee you that Sunrise, I mean, I don't know much about the organization, but I'm sure some, some of its major donors are Jewish. That's just generally the case with, with good liberal-leaning organizations. That's the world we live in. You know, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, Jews are very generous and, and philanthropic. And so there probably was some pushback in a good way from people who said, you know, we, we, we don't tolerate this type of, of singling out of organizations um, uh, uh, just because they're, they're, they have some sympathy with Israel. So I think part of it is how do we respond to it speaking back? Um, and by the way, this is as old as this is this goes back to the very beginning of Jewish life in America. You know, if you go back to the very beginning, the first Jews in America came to what was then New Amsterdam, uh, uh, which was governed by uh, Peter Stuyvesant, uh, uh, which was you know part of the uh, uh, you know part of part of New Amsterdam it was part of the the, the Dutch Empire, and P uh, uh, Peter Stuyvesant was not a fan of Jews. And the first, there, there were first 33 Jews who came from New Recife, Brazil, uh, fleeing the Inquisition, who landed in New Amsterdam. And Peter Stuyvesant wanted to kick them out. He didn't want, the, you know, he didn't want this new area polluted by Jews. And the only reason he did not succeed in doing that is that, um, is that there were people on the committee or, or on the board of the Dutch East India Company, who were Jewish, who said, "Sorry, Governor Stuyvesant, but that's not your call. Uh, we, you know, we we support our our co-religionists, our fellow Jews who are settling there." Um, so uh, now, one of the points you made, Marilyn, that I is is probably such a key part of of my argument in the book, and something I think we all hold to be true, is that. The way a society treats Jews is often a barometer of the way uh, minorities are treated more generally. A society that hates Jews usually hates anyone who is different. This is very, very important. Um, uh, think about, um, there's that famous poem from Nazi Germany where first they came for the trade unionists and I was not a trade unionist, so I didn't protest. Then they came for, you know, the the socialists and I didn't protest because I was a so because I wasn't a socialist and they came for the Jews and I didn't protest because I was not a Jew then they came for me and there was nobody left to say anything right so a society that is anti-Semitic is usually racist homophobic Islamophobic all those things um, Jews are are the miners canary uh, you know in, in in old times miners used to send a canary to see how dangerous a mine was, and if the canary died, you knew the mine was dangerous. Jews in some ways are that. If a society persecutes Jews, it persecutes others. So the uptick in anti-Semitism reflects the broader uptick in hatred in a society. Um, now, 
in terms of how anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism got linked, this is a very interesting history. In fact, I got involved with a project just recently. I said last week that before class, I'd had lunch with um, the guy who's the head of fundraising. He wasn't, at, uh, I gave him a little money, but he wasn't, at, that, that wasn't the purpose of our lunch, but um, he's involved with the Jewish National Fund. Uh, and um, they are doing a whole project to reclaim the word Zionism. That Zionism was at one point considered a progressive positive movement for Jewish self-determination. That was the origin. That this is this is something to be proud of. I mean, there are Zi socialist Zionist youth camps, but over time, the phrase Zionism came to be a pejorative. One of the reasons may be, you know, in the, in the United Nations in the early 1970s, there was that famous Zionism is racism resolution. Um, uh, uh, it, that, that as Israel became a stronger country, Zionism became associated with kind of ultra nationalism, aggressive warlike nationalism. So somehow Zionism took on these notes as, as even in that statement, it says Israel is a colonial project. That's the biggest criticism of Israel is that people see it as a colonial power. It's like, it's the West making its beachhead in the Middle East that Israel is just a front for American Western interests. And um, so Zionism is like another way of, of another form of colonialism. Um, and so uh, even Martin Luther King, there's a famous quote from Martin Luther King where he says, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Uh, so people who deny, who, who say that, that, that Zionism is, is racist are essentially saying Jews have no right to exist. Um, and, and, now, I think there are probably a lot of well-meaning people that don't know what Zionism is. So part of the, pro part of the project is education. Um, uh, but over time, it's the, the word Zionism has taken on this negative tinge, even among Jews, even among Jews. Um, it just, it's, um, uh, it, it's sad, but it's, it's kind of what, what, what has happened. Um, and, and part of our, our job is to, to recover that. Okay, Marsha. Um, okay, uh, and I, I just w I wanted to ask or, or comment that over the history of, of the state of Israel, there were many, many attempts to solve the, the peace problem and, the, and they fell through. And so I'm thinking Israel does have the upper hand but still it does take two sides. And you know, one side doesn't show up at the table, it poses, a problem, and I think both of them have so many non-starters. But um, there were so many attempts. But I think in the Netanyahu era, it, it came to a halt, and I think that's when a lot of groups started protesting against Jews in general. But then, I, but then the reason I raised my hand was th this was really frightening and. Um, I don't know, upsetting to me, it's, um, but I shouldn't be surprised. But in the news this week, I guess you know that um, many of the residents that were harmed, I mean, I think the whole country was harmed, but by the what happened in Charlottesville, sure. they're, they're, do, they're doing a civil suit um, be, to, you know, to bankrupt them, basically, so that they can't, you know, to, to diminish their right, power right, and hold. Right. Well, there was one attorney who who dropped them because he said they were saying all these horrific anti-Semitic things and they were quoting from Mein Kampf and uh, he he just couldn't take the case. So another lawyer chimed in and said, I'll take the case. I'm opposed to all those Jews and their power and influence on our society. And I thought, doesn't that disqualify him from practicing law? <laughs> I don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's part of, I think part of it is simply just the First Amendment. I mean, I, you know, in, in our call, anyone's entitled to legal representation, you know, uh, we may not like what the lawyer believes, but, you know, everyone's entitled to it. And so, you know, and he's, he's entitled to whoever the attorney is, is entitled to his views. And, you know, um, you know, he's probably not a, a guy we would ever want to hire as an attorney, but you know, may, maybe it does disqualify him in the eyes of a jury. I mean, you know, I mean, 
I, I don't know what's legitimate to bring up about an attorney or not, but you know, I think um, he, uh, certainly the 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 folks who organize the march are entitled to legal counsel, but um, uh, they're 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 probably not going to attract the best attorneys. I would I would think uh, they they may be they may be uh, scraping at the bottom of the barrel. Um, Sue and then Sandy. Um, to, to get to the title of your book, which you mentioned before about first the Jews and how nobody is safe if the Jews aren't safe. A perfect proof of that is Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. Six million Jews were murdered, but five million other people were also murdered. Anybody that didn't fit their Aryan uh, e example of what they felt a person should look like, should act like, should believe in. I mean, they took gypsies, they took gay people, they, anybody that wasn't, didn't fit their stereotype. Right. So yes, first the Jews, but 5 million others also. Well, exactly, exactly. Um, and, and, and this is actually a really interesting lens to view history through is, Societies that hate Jews tend to be failing societies. Think about, think about how America won World War II. You know, um, part of it was, of course, the, the atomic bomb. How, why was the, how was the atomic bomb invented? Well, it came from refugee scientists like Albert Einstein and Robert Oppenheim. These were refugees from Nazi Germany. The, the, the Nazi Germany lost its greatest intellectuals because it was anti-Semitic. This actually is a pattern that has repeated throughout history. You know, Spain excluded its Jews. I mean, anti-Semitism in Spain started really in the 1300s, but it culminated in 1492 with the expulsion of Jews from Spain. Essentially, the expulsion of Jews from Spain was the beginning of the end of the Spanish Empire. Spain's power declined precipitously in the 1500s until ultimately the England, you know, they, they were defeated by England in, in I think it was 1588. Um, so Spain, after it expelled its Jews, it was sort of on a downward spiral. Um, and the same thing happened in England. I mean, th th there is literally in, in many ways, the ebb and flow of history is connected to the role of the Jewish people. Now, some would call that just, you know, the divine providence that the way God works. I, I don't know whether it is or not. I think, I think in some ways it reflects a society's values. Jo and Jonathan Sachs, who died exactly one year ago yesterday, um, he talked about the dignity of difference, that a society that cannot tolerate difference, people who are different is a failing society. And that societies that embrace differences like the United States historically has done, e pluribus unum, out of the many one, many pluralism, that societies that embrace differences are societies that flourish. And Jews have always represented difference. We were always a tiny minority. In Christian Europe, we were a tiny minority. In ancient Greece, in ancient Rome, we were a minority. You know? All Jews have always been, except in the land of Israel, which is, you know, wonderful. But but Jews mo throughout most of history were a minority, and 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 so societies that allow Jews to to flourish and to exist are societies that succeeded, that societies that grew, that prospered. You know, what I mean, think if you were living in the 17th century. You'd want to live in Amsterdam, of all places. Amsterdam was the most prosperous, wonderful society in Europe. Where did most of the Jews from Spain end up going? To Amsterdam. So, I mean, the, 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 there, there's society, a society that embraces freedom, and especially freedom of religion, is a society that tends to do well. And those that hate Jews tend to hate others and tend to fall into decline. Yeah, Sandy. Uh, it was just a small comment about what Marcia said about the <clears throat> despicable attorney, you know, who was working with them. And really, Marcia, you know, I agree with you, but 
I'd rather know who my enemy is. And I'm glad that he was honest enough to come out with this ignorant statement. You know, I think that Jews want to know who, who people like that are. I agree. It's just that it's upsetting that that an attorney holds those views. You know, I, I, I agree. I, I agree that he that he should he should state his beliefs, but it it just seems to me that I I would think in law school they would, I mean, they would teach people to you know to examine their biases for why and maybe you know, do something it's not about really it. about the law. It's about drumming up clients. He said that to be the go-to attorney for people like those who did the uh, did that march. He he wants to be their attorney. He wants to make the money rather than some other attorney. That is as a, a retired brilliant attorney. analysis. Mm -hmm. That is a brilliant. It's a marketing tactic. There's a market. Who knows whether he actually believes it or not? That's that's a very good point. That's a but very Rabbi. Good point. You have to be carefully taught. And he developed that when he was eight years old. Right. But here, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And here's the other thing, actually. Let's assume, let's assume that he really believes that, which may be the case, or he, whether he does or just marketing. This actually proves something very important. Education does not solve anti-Semitism. Germany, 1930s Germany, was extremely well-educated. This is the most probably the most well-educated country in the world at that point. I mean, where did Abraham Joshua Heschel study at the University of Berlin? Joseph Soloveitchik, the Rebbe, Menachem Schneerson, they all studied in Germany. Germany was where you went if you wanted to get the highest education. Professors were revered in Germany. Germany was extremely educated, and yet it was also extraordinarily anti-Semitic. So in some the guy who's one of the leaders of the um of, of, of the far right, the alt-right, Richard Spencer. He's very educated. He went, in fact, I read about him. He went to um, a private school in Dallas that has a lot of Jewish kids in it called St. Mark's School. I think my brother-in-law went there. Uh, it's, a, it's a very prestigious, you know, it's kind of like the Francis Parker, you know, or, or, you know, a very, very upscale, you know, high-end private school. And that's where Richard Spencer who is the leader of the alt-right went to school there. And I think, I don't, I don't know where he went to college, but education does not, does not um, eliminate anti-Semitism. In fact, in some people, it can actually heighten it because they're, they're, they're more able to come up with rationalizations for hatred of Jews. In fact, one of the most notorious anti-Semites uh, in, in intellectual life was Martin Heidegger who is considered probably the most important philosopher of the 20th century. I mean, he essentially invented postmodernism, the idea of deconstruction. And um, Hannah Arendt was one of his students and lovers. Uh, uh, and he was a, he was a vicious anti-Semite. Um, and so um, this is very important. Education is not always the solution. I mean, we Jews, we love education. We believe passionately in education. But education doesn't solve all of society's ills. There are a lot, a lot of educated um, fools, one could say. Yeah. Who was next? Okay. Let me actually, I want to do a little bit of, of, of sort of history to understand why Jews were always targeted as, as those who are different. And really, part of it goes back to pre-Christianity. If you look at documents from before the common era when Jews generally lived in the Near East, you know, in, in, in Mesopotamia, um, uh, parts of North Africa. These were areas that were ruled by ultimately the Roman Empire. This is after the period of the Bible. We're going past the period of the Bible. This is when Jews were a minority in other countries. Jews were different primarily in two things. One, in the foods that they ate, so the dietary laws. Also the fact that Jews generally did not work on the Sabbath, Friday evening, the seventh day of the week. And so you have documents all the way back in ancient Greece saying Jews are lazy and unpatriotic because they refuse to work on the Sabbath. And so even then Jews were different. Jews were considered outsiders. Um, and 
<clears throat> they were especially bothersome outsiders. You know, if you look at, you know, look at the, the history of the Roman Empire in, in, the, in the first century, this is when the Romans destroyed the temple in ancient Jerusalem in 70 CE. It wasn't so much that Jews were Jewish. It's not like the Romans didn't like that Jews practice their religion. Rome tolerated lots of different groups. It's that Jews refused to subordinate their religious expression to the Romans. Jews, Jews did, not, did not follow Roman edicts about, you know, well, this was actually earlier where putting a statue of Zeus in the temple or, um, or being conscribed in the Roman army. Jews generally were a little bit more vocal and stubborn in their commitment to their religious life. There were plenty of other groups that didn't assimilate but Jews remained very strong in not assimilating. And this then, okay, this takes on a totally different hue in, in the rise of Christianity. So we all know the history that essentially Christianity started off as a branch of Judaism. Everyone knows that, you know, you know the first Jews were followers, were, the first Christians were Jewish followers of Jesus. And Jesus was a Jewish leader, whether he was a rabbi or a teacher or a healer. That's all. There's lots of different points of view. But in general, there was a, a man named Jesus of Nazareth, who was a popular charismatic teacher who had a Jew, from the Jewish community who had several Jewish followers, the 12 apostles being the first of them. They were all Jewish. Now, the Jesus movement um, grows after Jesus is murdered. So Jesus lives, one, one, of, uh, one of my friends, he's now 95, he was uh, named Newt Minow. He wanted me to title one of my books, Jesus Lived and Died as a Jew, which is all true. Jesus would not have known um, of, of any religion called Christianity. He believed he was Jewish. The followers of Jesus understood Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. So there was a major belief that the Messiah was coming. This was part of the, the cultural life of the first century. And when he died and was resurrected, supposedly, the Messiah has come. So this new group, this Jewish followers of Jesus said, well, Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. Why don't all the Jews come along with this new message? And so there was a division. There was a division between those who believed Jesus was the Messiah and those who weren't. And then, um, then th th there's a conflict with the Roman Empire. And essentially, the Jews who believe Jesus was the Messiah, they decide we are going to separate from the traditional Jewish group because they just won't believe. They, 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 they refuse to believe in our Messiah, that, that the Jewish Messiah came. And then the Roman Empire essentially persecutes the traditional Jews and tolerates Jews uh, uh, Jews who are following Jesus. And over time, it takes a couple of hundred years, but this new movement entirely separates from Judaism. But part of the theology of this new movement is that Jews, traditional Jews, let's just say the original Jews, let's just say it that way, even though that's, that's not a great term. Let's say the original Jews have to suffer in order to prove the error of their ways. So that if they suffer, they will ultimately become followers of Jesus. They will see the light. And so essentially Jewish suffering becomes a necessary attribute of Christian life and Christian Europe. And then when Constantine, Emperor Constantine, converts to Christianity, I think it's three, 313 CE, somewhere around then, somewhere in that period of time, Constantine converts to Christianity and the Roman Empire essentially becomes Christian. Jews now are a total minority that existence has to be one of suffering. And by the way, this isn't, we don't talk about this very much. There were a lot of conversions from Judaism to Christianity at this point. You know, a lot, Jews were pretty big people. The Jews were 10% of the Roman empire. Um, and a lot, so a lot end up becoming Christian. 
And this idea, Christianity by necessity has to have Jews as second-class citizens because it proves the truth of the Christian way and the error of the Jewish way. Um, uh, and the, 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 the person who said this most eloquently if you want, was uh, Augustine, St. Augustine, you know, uh, uh, very important Catholic philosopher. And he wrote a book essentially saying, Jews should exist, but they should exist in a miserable way. And this carries over uh, to um, throughout the Middle Ages. And not only that, over time, Jews came to represent evil. And that's not a, that's not a far, that's, that's not a far leap, right? Going from Jews have to suffer because A, they never followed Jesus. And then B, they also killed Jesus. Remember, there's that, there's that famous verse from the Gospel of Matthew, his blood be upon us and on our children. That was taken, that was interpreted to mean that we are responsible, the Jewish people, us and our children through, through all generations are responsible for murdering our Messiah. And so Jews both have to suffer and they epitomize evil. And that is expressed in Christian doctrine, in Christian art. If you look at art from the Middle Ages, uh, Jews are often depicted as with horns. Why is that? Because the devil has horns. Uh, 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 the, their, their Jews are depicted as greedy. Now that is an interesting, there, there's actually a lot of interesting economic analysis of this. Jews, even though they were hated and demonized, they actually played a very important role in Christian society uh, as money lenders, as, as necessary, you know, uh, a society has to have credit and lending in order to grow. And within, you know, the New Testament forbids Christians from lending money to other Christians with interest, but you have to lend money with interest in order for an economy to grow. And so Jews essentially functioned in that role uh, and, and, and it was a necessary role, but when economies turned sour, Jews were often blamed too. So you had religious arguments against Jews, economic arguments against Jews, um, uh, and that, that really, during the Middle Ages especially, that was the height of Christian dominance. The Pope was the most powerful figure in the world. Essentially, the Pope was the, was, was, was the, the equivalent of the president and the current Pope combined. It was political and religious power. Uh, and Jews were the ultimate outsiders. And, and that is that, that kind of shaped all of Western. This is why Jews represent outsiders, because the culture of Western Europe was such that, that, there, that, that the Christian was the insider and Jews were the outsider. And this actually goes a little bit to psychology. And um, I'm going to get a little philosophical here, but there's a, uh, I talked about him in my Yom Kippur sermon. Uh, uh, there was a philosopher named Rene Girard who taught at Stanford. And Rene Girard is, is very famous for the, the scapegoat theory. And essentially Girard said, every society has a scapegoat and all the tensions in a society are taken out on the scapegoat. And essentially the scapegoat is like a, a cathartic, you know, society is filled with con conflict and we take out all the energy of that conflict on a scapegoat so that we can restore ourselves back to normal. And that that is, is sort of how a society has to exist. And in Christian Europe, Jews were the scapegoat. And so the, all the, 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 the hatreds, the, 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 the internecine political conflicts, everything was taken out on Jews. By the way, one could argue that historically in America, blacks have been the scapegoat. You know, every society has scapegoats. You know, every, you know, uh, 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 there's no society that doesn't have it. In, in China, there are scapegoats. In America, there are scapegoats. I mean, you know, it, it, you know, it depends on bigger or lesser, however big the country is. Even in local communities, there are scapegoats. 
You know, they're, 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 that's according to Rene Girard, that's almost encoded in our brain. And so because Europe was predominantly shaped by the Catholic church, which saw Jews in hostile terms, Western life emerged with Jews as the ultimate scapegoat. But it's a different kind of scapegoat because Jews, it's almost like the older brother scapegoat because we are also, Christians are also related to Jews. Our, 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 the, the, the Christian Bible includes the Jewish Bible. So it's not like a scapegoat that is totally different from us. It's a scapegoat that is also kind of like us, which makes it in some ways even more destructive, which is, it makes sense because remember German Jews, there, there, somebody wrote about this once. They said German Jews were more German than the Germans. Like German Jews loved Germany. Like Her Hermann Kohn is a great example of this. Hermann Kohn believed that Germany was the epicenter of the world. You know, even the German Jews who came to the United States, they continued to speak German. They believed German was, you know, the greatest language. So in some ways, um, the, the, we, we sometimes hate people that are very much like us. And yet they also become the scapegoat. Okay, I just covered a lot of... There's, it doesn't always make total sense. It's not really rational. That's one of the things Rene Girard talked about. Um, the scapegoating is, is often, it's, it's a function of something buried deep within our psyche. And this might help us understand why anti-Semitism continues to last. There's no rational basis for it. There is no rational basis for anti-Semitism. I mean, think about it. if you're an Arab country, there, you, if you were smart and you cared about the well-being of your citizens, you would want to ally with Israel and trade with Israel. There's no rational basis for it. It's something deeper. Okay, a couple questions. I saw some hands. Yeah, Julie, go ahead. One of the things that I find especially interesting in this whole topic is that Christianity having come out of Judaism and out of the Judas, Jewish texts um, established itself as the true religion. They had truth with a capital T. And the existence of the Jews was always a thorn in their side or something to show that even though they had the truth, there were other people who came from the same religious texts who interpreted it differently and didn't see Christianity as the true religion. And in order to um, show that Christians, Christianity really was the true religion, it was important that Jews should exist, but be suppressed, that Jews wouldn't have a, a full life, a, a successful life, because they didn't choose the right path. But their existence always showed to the Christians that the Christians did choose the right path. Exactly. Exactly. You got it right. And this is why, and we'll get to this next week. Hitler's anti-Semitism was much worse than Christianity because Christianity said at least Jews should survive in order to suffer so that they can prove that we're right. Hitler, and then this is not just Hitler, this is genocidal anti-Semitism broadly, says Jews should be extinguished as a people at all. Because Hitler was anti-Christian as well. I mean, you know, he had a, Hitler was anti, you know, he, Hitler in, he was preceded by Nietzsche, believed that Jews are also responsible for Christianity. And Christianity is responsible for the protection of the weak and the, the gospel positive message. And Hitler and others were anti-Christian too. So this was part of a, a twist in the argument to say, Jews are not only responsible for evil, Jews are also responsible for Christianity. And Christianity is responsible for this Western ethic of mercy, which is against the Ubermensch, the Uberman that Nietzsche and Hitler, the Aryan race was all about. So um, uh, uh, that's, that's another, you know, anti-Semitism, as I've talked about, is a virus. It takes on new forms. It takes a new variant. It goes from being a thorn in the side of Christianity to, you know, the symbol of Western, you know, uh, 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 religion. Yeah. Okay, good. Marilyn?
go ahead. Yeah, Marilyn, un unmute yourself. Oh, we can't hear you. Oh, we can't hear you. Okay. Um, other question. I got it. Oh, good. Okay. I got it. I I uh, I really uh, think Julie brought up a really good point, and I agree with her wholeheartedly. I I do um, think that it's remarkable a small people with faith and belief in monotheism without the great power that the Greeks had, that the Romans had. What happened to them? We still existed, this small little nation. We have our own nation. When you think back in history, this is miraculous. And it still is. I mean, what we have today is a miracle and we need to keep it alive and we need to study this and we need to do just what we're doing and more people need, be need, need to be doing it, as I said earlier. More religious leaders need to learn from you and need to take this lesson and, and spread it to the world. Yeah, I, I, thank you. Um, and this is an interesting topic that I would like to explore also in a future class is, you know, how Jews in some ways survived because we were always a minority. You know, power ultimately, empires ultimately fall. Think about it as we did. Ancient Egypt fell. Ancient Rome fell. The ancient Islamic empire, the Ottoman empire fell. Even Great Britain, which, you know, the sun never sets on the British empire fell. I mean, Britain still exists as a country, but, you know, America right now, we're not really an empire. We're sort of an empire. It's a slight, you know, it's a, people say it's a benevolent empire, It, but America, we got our own problems, you know, and, and China is on the rise. And, you know, this is in some ways part of the pattern of history that empires, and there's a lot of reasons for that. There was a, there was a great book about this called The Rise and Fall of the Great Empires by Paul M. Kennedy, which was a great book, but it actually ended up being totally wrong because he said Japan is on its way up. And then like literally two years after uh, uh, the book was written, Japan went into a recession that it's never really come out of. And that was like 30 years ago. So, you know, I mean, so, you know, no one can actually predict how these things pan out, but the idea is that empires ultimately collapse. And Jews, we were never an empire. We were always a minority, um, essentially connected by a book by the Torah and by a set of practices. And maybe the fact that we never were an empire allowed us to survive. It's very, it, it, it's um, been thinking a lot about this. Uh, wanna write something sort of in this, in this area, sort of a, what accounts for Jewish survival. And part of it is the fact that we were never an empire. And part of it is the fact that we were always thinking in future generations. Okay. Any final comments? Anti-Semitism is based on jealousy. Yes and no. I mean, I think yes, part of it. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, there are plenty of other, you know, there are plenty of other successful people in the world. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, uh, in some ways it's based on jealousy, yes, but it's also based on just, you know, uh, uh, a, a hatred um, of difference, of someone who looks different. Um, and, and acts differently. Um, and for a lot of, for most of history, Jews were very poor, you know, Jews, you know, uh, for most of, m most Jews throughout time lived to subsistence levels. Um, uh, uh, so it is, it is, um, it, it's a complicated question, but I definitely think that's a big part of it. Yes, the Jewish world of Alexander Hamilton, I'm reading that book right now. It's excellent. It's excellent. Uh, yeah, it, it's about Jewish life. And I, I'm going to give a lecture on it at some point for a Sunday morning adult education. Essentially, the author makes a pretty compelling case to say Alexander Hamilton was indeed Jewish, was raised Jewish. He just certainly didn't practice Judaism. But uh, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. Um, he, he went to a Jewish school. He went to a Jewish day school. That is all confirmed. That's 100 percent confirmed. Why would he have gone to a Jewish day school if he wasn't Jewish? There's a lot of, there's potential answers to that, but it is a very interesting book, The Jewish World of Alexander Hamilton. Um, okay, I wish all of you a wonderful rest of the week and I will see you next time. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.
Have a good Thank day, everybody. So much. Have a good day. Um, Terrific. Awesome.